it feels like men and women have very different ideas about love, like what love should be. Um, mm -hmm. Men seem to be able to separate, you know, sex and love, um, whereas women have a more all-encompassing uh, vision of love. Um, do you think that that's true? I mean, do you think that there's this division between how men and women conceive of love? And from my perspective, um, I think those, if there are different conceptions, it has to do with maximizing our, you know, evolutionary fitness, um, you know, getting back to men having a lot of cheaply produced gametes that, you know, they want to get into the world and women having a, a, a supply of, of a limited supply of eggs and wanting to maximize, uh, the fitness, uh, and resources of their mates to, um, to ensure the, the survival of offspring. So do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I have lots of thoughts on that. Um, <laughs> so this is one of those areas where, uh, the fact that evolutionary biology and, and a lot of evolutionary psychology for the longest time was predominantly conducted by men is something that should at least cause us to be careful about how we evaluate that literature. Because yeah. if men are conducting science, talking about what men and women are like, uh, they might have certain assumptions that they build into their research questions. Um, there is a theory that goes back to Robert Trivers called parental investment theory, and this is meant to apply to all sorts of mm -hmm. animal species, including humans. And the idea is just that in any sexually reproducing species, uh, you may have a case, and you often do have a case, where you have an asymmetry in the minimum effort that one member of the sex partnership has to invest to have a viable offspring. And so in humans, it's the idea that males who carry sperm have to essentially just contribute the sperm and then they can walk away and go do something else and it's it's least possible that the child will survive and so the way to maximize their reproductive fitness the theory goes is to just impregnate as many people as you can with as little investment as possible and then that that will be a winning strategy uh -huh. you'll get your genes on into the next generation and then the thought is any kind of suite of behavioral dispositions that promotes the passing on of genes to the next generation should be selected for by uh, right. evolutionary uh, processes through natural selection and the thought is that uh Females of our species have a different kind of a thing going on, which is that if they become pregnant, then they have a minimum of nine months of totally taking over their body and then some period of time in the ancestral environment of breastfeeding and weaning and so forth. And so if they want to have a viable offspring, they don't have a, they don't have a choice. They must commit much more than the male of the species must commit in order to pass their genes on to the next generation. And the thought is that this fundamental biological asymmetry should lead to concomitant behavioral dispositions that should differ between males and females of right, the species. Right. Okay. So that makes sense as far as it goes. There are also uh, addendums or addenda to the to this theory, which, which talk about uh, the reproductive advantages that would come to females of our species who have what's called extra pair copulations. And so you see this actually uh -huh. in other animal species too. Um, so the thought goes, uh, Really, the best strategy for a female of our species, assuming that our only goals and values were to pass our genes on to the next generation, would be to have a relatively low status male who isn't going to be getting a lot of mating opportunities, but who will be around and help care for and protect the child and provide food for the child and so forth. While at the same time, that child should be genetically uh, the result of a very fit male who is getting all sorts of sexual opportunities. And so what is in this female's best interest would be to sneak away in the bush and have sex with a high status male and then convince this low status male that actually that that's right. uh, uh, his child yes. and then get the parental care from that male while getting the genetic uh, benefit of having mated with this right. this other male. So what that would predict is that there's there's good, as it were, biological reasons for females to uh, also have more sexual partners than just the, the person mm -hmm. with whom they may be forming a long term pair bond. So that's the biological story. Um, all of, so insofar as that's true, if there are these underlying biological differences on average between males and females of our species, yeah. uh, which that may be true, there's, there's a lot of work for culture to do to either reinforce or amplify these supposed or alleged or claimed differences or to uh, redirect them or suppress them or build up cultural institutions that naturalize yeah. them and, and, and turn them into things that are uh, thought of as good because they're seen as natural. Uh, 
or whatever. And the problem is that there's just no way to filter out the cultural lens. So when we're conducting mm -hmm. our science, when we're trying to figure out what's true of our species, we are a cultural species. So the thing is that yeah. we're precisely a species that who's partly its survival uh, mechanism and adaptation is to have culture, institutions, moral norms, and other sorts of things, which are in, in some ways the sorts of things that uh, take us away from these seeming biological imperatives. Right. And so it's because it's not possible to filter that out very well when we're yeah. doing our science, look at the biological dimensions of our species. It's really hard to know how strong these supposed uh, differences are and whether maybe it's a little bit of a difference that then gets amplified by culture and then uh -huh. is claimed to be natural and is therefore reified. And then, right. you know, and, yeah. and the other thing too, when you say, you know, men and women are generally speaking different in terms of how they see the relationship between sex and, and relationships generally. Um, it may be that there's some little difference biologically, but what happens is once that's the cultural narrative, if you grow up and you, you identify as a, a, a female or a woman in the culture, you're obviously aware of certain scripts and expectations and norms and yeah. uh, stereotypes that pertain to people like you. And your own desires then are going to be shaped by what you think is normal or natural or expected in your society. And so it might well be that as a consequence of these cultural norms, it is true that many women and many men or women and men on average have different attitudes about the relationship between sex and uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. But but you can't turn the dial to figure out how much of that is biology and how much of that is culture. Yeah, I, I, I think that that makes sense. I mean, um, there's uh, I mean, you can think of a lot of things like that where there's maybe small differences between men and women and then um and maybe to to appear appear more tra attractive to a mate you might amplify those differences so then you're then you're saying like wow that that uh male's very masculine that that female's very you know feminine so like makeup would be an example of that where women exaggerate their you know, the size of their eyes and their, the color of their cheeks and their lips and everything to kind of amplify those differences that are already there. Um, That's certainly true, at least in some cultures. I don't know how uh, universal that is as a phenomenon, but yeah. my understanding is that as a pretty broad uh, characterization of, of different cultural groups, there are some attempt or another among those who are in a kind of male gender role and those in a female gender role to amplify whatever biological differences or presumed biological differences exist yeah. as part of this kind of mating uh, game that gets played. That seems to be a fairly common phenomenon across yeah. societies. Yeah. And, and I think one of the ways that that issue is addressed, like not knowing if it's, if it's um, cultural or it's biological, is looking at cross-cultural studies. And then you can kind of weed out what sorts of things aren't um, you know, that are cultural or that are, are sort of innate. Um, so I think if you looked at, say, you know, how many, and sorry, I don't have a study like on the top of my mind, but if you looked at, say, the average number of sexual partners that, you know, m men had versus women, you know, would you find that on average that those differed significantly across cultures, then you could say, well, maybe there's something behind that that's not, being that's not culturally and being reinforced that it's actually um you know something that's innate or instinctual that would be one sort of evidence that could weigh a little bit in favor of one of those views over the other but yeah. even that evidence is hard to interpret because uh at least in the last uh, 100 years or so the the dominance of western culture over other mm. uh societies is is so strong that it's hard to you have to go into yeah. these rare special cases where you get the untouched uh, hunter-gatherer group, <laughs> and then you can sort of do studies among them. But then you don't know how representative that right. hunter-gatherer group is and their cultural practices compared to some others. So um, there's been this concern in the recent literature that, at least in psychology, there's too much emphasis on studying what are called weird populations, which are those who are uh, white or Western educated people from industrialized rich <laughs> democracies yeah. is what that stands for. Yeah. And uh, so the thought was we should be studying, we should be studying other cultures. Otherwise, if we're making these generalized claims, we're really just projecting out from, you know, the undergraduate uh, research participants that we're getting from, you know, American universities is, is some large proportion of psychology studies. And, and that's true. But then Paul Rosen, uh, a famous psychologist, wrote a response to that where, where he said, uh, for better or worse, weird 
culture is the future of global culture because mm -hmm. of the power and the reach of Western media and uh, geopolitical forces and so forth. So by studying these weird people, we are maybe studying the future of much of human culture. Mm -hmm.